Il est 12h05, on va débuter. Alors, pour ceux qui ne me connaissent pas, je suis Julie Messier, je suis professeure à l'École de kinésiologie. Alors, je suis ici pour vous présenter notre nouvelle recrue, donc à l'École de kinésiologie, Jason Neva. Euh, alors, Jason, il a fait sa maîtrise euh, en kinésiologie à York University. Ensuite, il a poursuivi au PhD à, à l'Université de Waterloo pour finalement faire des études postdoctorales à UBC, à l'École de réadaptation, où là, il y a plus... Euh, discuter de stroke, oui. donc euh, AVC. Et aujourd'hui, il va nous entretenir à propos de la neuroplasticité, l'apprentissage moteur et euh, l'exercice. Donc, euh, je suis certaine que ça sera fascinant. Je lui laisse Merci. la parole. Merci pour l'introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, forgive me for my uh, English. I'm learning French. Uh, soon I'll be presenting in, in French, I hope, but uh, for now I'll continue in, in English. So thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Dr. Messier. I'm very uh, happy to be here. Thanks for the uh, introduction, uh, or sorry, for the uh, invitation uh, for this conference here at the CRI UGM. And uh, as uh, Dr. Messier mentioned, I'm a new professor in the, uh, uh, in the School of Kinesiology and here uh, a researcher at the CRI UGM as well. I'm very happy to talk about my research that I've done over the last uh, few years, and I, my hope is that I uh, can inspire some interest, or spark some interest, inspire some conversation, and perhaps some collaboration in the future uh, with this talk as well. So with that, I'll get started. So my, my research interest can really be summed up in this sentence, uh, understanding the neuroplasticity mechanism supporting motor learning. And my uh, research is motivated by evidence uh, that shows that there's common neuroplasticity mechanisms underlying both healthy motor skill learning in the non-damaged or healthy brain and relearning function after stroke or regaining function after stroke and other neurodegenerative diseases. And I'll define neuroplasticity here as the ability of the brain to form and reorganize itself just in general. So this then brings me the t to the topic of my talk today, which includes, kind of, like I said, an introduction of my field of interest. Uh, I'll talk about my three main research streams, and then I'll talk about a project or two within each of these streams that I've done uh, or am doing uh, uh, recently. So my field of interest generally, uh, which comes from the, the previous slide, is that uh, I'm interested in understanding to enhance and transfer the knowledge of central nervous system mechanisms underlying motor learning. And my three research streams span from fundamental uh, or basic kind of mechanistic science to more applied research uh, as well. <clears throat> and those three research streams include understanding the neural mechanisms or neuroplasticity mechanisms of motor learning and motor control, understanding the impact of interventions like acute exercise on motor learning and neuroplasticity. And then third, my applied research stream, I apply this knowledge uh, in uh, maintenance of motor function in aging, uh, and recovery <coughs> of function in stroke, and in uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease as well. So during this talk, I'll largely focus on the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, in order to both measure and modulate brain excitability to uh, investigate my research streams. So I'll begin with my first fundamental research stream, uh, understanding the neural mechanisms of motor learning and motor control. <clears throat> so our ability to produce goal-directed movements, uh, uh, to learn novel motor skills, and adapt already learned motor skills to new and challenging information is, is new and challenging situations, excuse me, is essential to our daily lives. It's how we interact with the world around us, and there's a number of examples every day that we uh, do, and if you consider yourself like an amateur musician like myself, uh, then that's also a, a daily task as well. So just to define the terms at the top of the slide, motor control defined is the regulation of movement by a central nervous system for those organisms who are lucky enough to have a central nervous system. It involves voluntary movement and reflexes, which is a huge, huge field and, and, and thing to figure out, which we're still figuring out. Now, motor learning is something that's different, although it's within <coughs> motor control. Uh, it's something that, that is unique in and of, in and of itself. It, and it's difficult to define uh, motor learning, and there's actually not a precise agreement on the exact definition of motor learning. But I've come across this particular one that I like. And motor learning is the process by which movements are performed better quicker and more accurately than before. Now I think what I'd add to this definition uh, that's essential for motor learning is that 
these improvements in performance are relatively permanent. So there can't just be a improvement in motor performance in a single session, but there needs to be some sort of evidence of improvement at a later date, whether it's an hour later, two hours, two days, and so on and so forth. So there are different forms of motor learning or types of motor learning uh, that are studied in the research and that I'll touch on here that have uh, behavioral, distinct behavioral characteristics and neurophysiological characteristics as well. Wow. That's a nice scene. <laughs> but it's not my slide. Cool. Okay. Merci. Um, so yeah, uh, the motor learning types uh, that I'll just touch on today are motor sequence learning and motor adaptation learning. Now these aren't the only types of motor learning, but these can be kind of two general categories. I think that you can uh, uh, talk about when you're when you're discussing motor learning. Motor sequence learning involves the learning of novel patterns of movement. For example, playing the piano, playing the guitar, tying a tie, something like that. Motor adaptation is a little bit different where it's the recalibration of already learned movements. So for example, using a gas pedal, steering wheel, and gear shifter of a different car. So regardless of the motor learning types, uh, several decades of research have now shown that neuroplasticity occurs in many different brain areas to support motor learning, as I'm just showing by this uh, uh, image here, basically showing that the whole brain is involved in the process of motor learning. But one particular, and, and, and different areas are, are maybe more involved in the early stages versus the late stages of motor learning, for example. But one particular area is vitally important through all the stages and, and all the types of motor learning, it seems, which is the primary motor cortex, or M1. But it seems that there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, knowledge that we don't know still about how the motor cortex can be involved in more, what I'll say, relatively simple motor control processes versus complex motor learning processes. So as I stated before, uh, my work largely uses transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, in order to measure the neural mechanisms of motor learning and motor control. And the way that TMS generally works is that we use a small stimulating coil, hold it over, uh, over individuals' heads, and the, the coil generates a small uh, uh, electromagnetic field that passes the skull and can stimulate non-invasively the neurons within the brain. And when we hold this small stimulating coil over the motor cortex, we can activate the motor cortex into neurons, and this sends descending volleys of activity down the corticospinal tract that eventually reaches the target muscles. And this creates a muscle twitch or a muscle contraction. And we can pick this up with service electromyography. And this muscle contraction shows up as a clear waveform known as the motor evoked potential, or MEP. And for those who haven't seen uh, TMS in action, maybe, I'm sure a, a lot of you have, but uh, this is my colleague, Ju Dr. Julia Schmidt. And she's OK with me showing <laughs> her in this photo as she's used uh, uh, this photo and some of her, uh, or video and some of her talks. Um, I think you could see, yeah, there we go. You see the little kind of uh, focal hand movement after when I'm using just a single pulse of TMS in order to make a muscle contraction. The contrast isn't so good on this laptop. You should see a very nice motor evoked potential here, but trust me, this is what it looks like. Um, so yeah, this is TMS in action and um, in order to measure the excitability of the brain. And we can quantify the size of this MEP in a lot of different ways to give us a sense of brain excitability and specifically corticospinal excitability. And the real benefit of TMS is that we can use ver uh, various uh, uh, measures of this motor evoked potential as a surrogate biomarker of neuroplasticity before and after an intervention like skilled motor learning, exercise, and in health and uh, neurological conditions like stroke and Parkinson's disease to understand the functioning of the brain. So what's been found so far in terms of motor skill learning and motor control is that motor skill practice induces changes in the corticospinal excitability. A lot of studies have found somewhat 
desperate things so far. So most studies have found as we practice motor tasks, there's an increase in the MEP amplitude or the size of this motor evoked potential. And that's interpreted to be an increase in motor cortex plasticity. At the same time, other studies have found that as we practice motor skills, there's a decrease in the size of these motor evoked potential amplitudes. And this is also interpreted as an increase in motor cortex plasticity, somewhat contradictory uh, findings, and they both could be true, certainly. But regardless of that, cortical spinal excitability modulation is thought to be associated with motor skill learning rather than just mere repetitive movement and execution of motor control, for the most part. Some studies have found that repetitive movement practice not necessarily associated with learning a skill can also modulate cortical spinal excitability in similar ways. So what is the role of the motor cortex in motor learning and motor control? The current knowledge so far is lacking and findings are somewhat uh, contradictory so far. So I proposed in this study that I'm setting up to show you uh, two potential reasons for these somewhat contradictory findings and the lack of knowledge we currently have. Could be due to the nature of the motor tasks used in the literature, uh, where they're widely different and not necessarily controlling, for example, if they're learning a sequence or not. Uh, important parts of the motor task aren't controlled for like that necessarily all the time. And I think what's maybe more important is that the role of unique interneurons within the primary motor cortex may play an important role, and they have not been investigated um, yet. That's it. Until now. Um, so I, in the study that I'm setting up, I, I used kind of a little bit more advanced transcranial magnetic stimulation methods to understand how the primary motor cortex is involved in both motor control, and here's a very important example of motor control I consider, and motor learning as well. So in order to examine this uh, specific question, I took advantage of recent advances in transcranial mag magnetic stimulation research and technology uh, to measure M1 interneurons, or show that M1 interneurons can be measured by altering the TMS current direction in the brain. So these different interneuron sets within the primary <laughs> motor cortex uh, have different neurophysiological characteristics, as I'm showing by this schematic. Both of these interneurons within the motor cortex, for example, both synapse onto the corticospinal output neuron to produce movement, but likely in different ways. So you can preferentially activate this one set of interneurons by using posterior to anterior TMS current. That's the traditional type of TMS where the current direction is going from the back to the front. And I'll call these interneurons PA sensitive interneurons. We can also activate a separate group of interneurons by reversing the TMS current to go in the anterior to posterior direction the, from the front uh, to the back. And I'll refer to these as AP sensitive uh, interneurons. There's also evidence, uh, evidence, a little bit of evidence that gathered that showed that um, these different interneurons have re different relationships to behavioral uh, aspects of, of motor tasks. So for example, PA sensitive interneurons seem to be more associated and correlated with repetitive task practice that are, doesn't require a lot of uh, a high level of skill, whereas these AP sensitive interneurons are more associated with motor preparation, are altered with attention allocation and are more related to adaptation pra task practice, so tasks that are more complex, for example. So to date, though, there's been no studies that have investigated specifically how these interneurons may change with actual physical task practice. So my hypothesis was that these unique interneurons, based on the, the stuff that we do know, are differentially impacted by motor learning and motor control. So the methods and design of this study is I, of course, used transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I used this over the primary motor cortex of the dominant hemisphere, which is the trained hemisphere. I did these measures before, during, and after motor skill practice. I recorded this information from the trained abductor pollicis brevis, brevis muscle, the uh, thumb muscle. And the main measure that I'm sharing with you today, among other measures that I took, is short interval intracortical inhibition, and known as SICI in the TMS literature. It's a paired pulse <coughs> method of TMS. 
It's a little different than what I showed you before in that uh, video in the image. Um, and what we do with this type of paired pulse TMS is we compare a single pulse of TMS, like I showed you before, that gives us a certain size of a motor evoked potential and corticospinal excitability assessment. And then we use paired pulse TMS, where we use two pulses of TMS in very quick succession, two milliseconds apart, and what results is a smaller MEP. And this is thought to result from inhibitory uh, circuits blocking or, or suppressing the MEP that comes out. So then we compare these, the size of these MEPs in a ratio, and the main point is, is that this gives us a percentage of motor cortex inhibition. This allows us to measure these circuits of intracortical inhibition within the motor cortex. And I did these measures in this study in both the PA and AP sensitive TMS current directions. And how I measured or tried to delineate between motor control and motor learning was using this motor task called the continuous tracking task. And what I had individuals do is come into the lab on two separate occasions and use a customized uh, joystick and they made isolated abduction and adduction thumb movements in order to control a cursor movement that went up and down to track either a repeated sequence on the one occasion or a random sequence on the other occasion. Now the difference between these two tasks, the repeated sequence is complex, but it's repeating, unbeknownst to the participant. The random sequence is complex, but it's never repeating. So theoretically, it can't be acquired, learned, or predicted. So therefore, I use this repeated sequence to uh, uh, liken towards motor learning, whereas the random sequence was more generalized motor control. So not surprisingly, what we found with our behavioral results was that performance increased for the repeated sequence, the one that could be predicted and acquired. On, the, on this graph here, just to orient you to it, there's time lag on the y-axis in milliseconds, so with higher values indicating better performance. That just means that people are tracking that target more closely. Uh, on the uh, x-axis, we have blocks of trials of practice. And what we can see in black, the repeated sequence condition, everybody uh, tended to increase significantly more. They improved at this task during the acquisition day, and then 24 hours later, they came back and they actually maintained that performance. So they retained that information. And so we can say that they actually did show motor learning for this particular sequence, whereas the random sequence they didn't really get better at or learn, which is what we predicted. So our neurophysiological findings were kind of interesting and, and different, uh, uh, somewhat different compared to the behavioral findings. So first, the result that I'm showing you here is that these PA-sensitive TMS measures, that forward direction of the pulse, changed similarly for both practice sequences. On the y-axis, we have uh, percent unconditioned stimulus with higher values indicating decreased inhibition, whereas lower values indicate increased inhibition. And on the x-axis, I have my time points of measurement. So I did a double baseline. Baseline measurement had people rest uh, for the same amount of time that they would do the practice task did another baseline measurement, and then I did measurement after 10 minutes and 20 minutes of practice of the task. And what you can see is regardless of sequence, repeated or random, the PA-sensitive excitability changes very similarly. Contrarily, the AP-sensitive excitability, this, it's the same graph, same setup, we can see that it only changed for repeated sequence practice. So what we found here is that after the double baseline, after 10 minutes of practice, which is kind of interesting, there was a similar decrease in both repeated and random practice. But then after an additional 10 minutes of practice, there was a, a continued decrease in inhibition for the repeated sequence, but the random sequence went back down to baseline. So not only did I find this, but I also found that the change in AP sensitive TMS measure, that AP SICI, predicted the repeated sequence performance. So on the y-axis, we have that change in AP-sensitive SICI, and on the x, we have time lag for the repeated sequence. So basically, as people performed better at the task and improved, they showed a lessening or decrease in inhibition in that AP-sensitive measure only, uh, as, I, as I looked at all the other measures as well. So in this study, I believe I've confirmed and extended evidence that these different motor cortex interneurons likely exist. There's a little more evidence for that now, I think. And also a few other novel pieces of information that I believe I found that AP interneurons seem to respond to sequence motor learning and code for sequence learning. 
whereas these AP sensitive interneurons respond to motor control <coughs> regardless of sequence. I believe this uh, result also shows that it's a, it's a partial explanation, I should say, for how the motor cortex may paradoxically code for both motor learning and motor control based on the existence of these interneurons within the motor cortex. So, and now on to my, uh, my second theme of my fundamental research, which is investigating the impact of things, interventions like acute exercise. Just take a quick drink. So this uh, research is motivated by my work and other people's work to show that exercise enhances motor learning. And exercise, can, uh, acute exercise, can enhance motor learning and possibly neuroplasticity mechanisms as well. And specifically, what I'll refer to as my exercise throughout the talk and what I, I typically use is an acute bout of lower limb cycling exercise on a stationary bike like this that lasts about 20 minutes in duration and that's moderate to vigorous in intensity. And the motor learning tasks that I use and the TMS measures for that matter too are all with the upper limb because I wanted to see the kind of generalizability of lower limb cycling exercise to the upper limbs and what we typically use our, our limbs for for motor learning, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, so in a recently published study on the behavioral uh, aspects of exercise enhancing motor learning, I found that exercise enhances motor adaptation and interlimb transfer. And I'll just explain this task here. Um, I'll play these videos as I'm explaining it. So. I had individuals come in, in, into the lab and perform a visually guided reaching task using what's called the Kinarm robotic manipulandum. And um, I'm just showing you that we did familiarization reaching tasks with the right and left arm with aligned visual feedback. So they actually couldn't see the, their, this cartoon image of the arm or that weird blue <laughs> arm as well. All they could see is the targets and the little white uh, cursor that represented their movement. So they performed reaching uh, movements with the left and right arms just to get familiarized with the task. After this, they performed the acute bout of leg cycling exercise, which was followed by the experimental manipulation, which was the vision motor rotation task. And here's the difference here. So what we had with this task, it's, a, it's a quite a robust task that's used in the literature. The actual cursor representing hand movement veers off in a different direction systematically. Uh, and in this case, it's actually veering off 45 degrees clockwise. <laughs> uh, 45 degrees clockwise. And so individuals then, the goal is to get the cursor that's veering off in that direction to still go to the target. So in this way, this is a, a very robust motor adaptation task, adapting for the sensory motor mismatch. And what you can see, actually, the last uh, reach, the person is starting to actually learn or adapt uh, uh, to this rotation. So people struggle with it at first, but over time, very few trials, like maybe even 60 to 80 trials, people are learning to adjust for this visual, visual rotation uh, and to get the cursor to go to the target. So I, I measured that after exercise, and I also measured, oh, whoops, sorry. That was mine. <laughs> um, I also measured interlimb transfer. So the reason that I had both uh, 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 reaching with the right and left arms is because I wanted to see <coughs> how that adaptation that's been, that, that's been enhanced perhaps by exercise can transfer over to the uh, a non-trained limb. So I wanted to test the phenomenon of interlimb transfer, which is the idea that as you learn a task with one arm, it can a certain portion of it can transfer over to the opposite untrained limb. I also wanted to investigate this because uh, of the potential impact or transfer to uh, stroke rehabilitation as well. I had individuals come back 24 hours later for a no exercise retention test to see how they did with both the left and right arms under the same visual motor rotation. And what I found was that exercise improved reaching accuracy during skill acquisition. Uh, on the y-axis, we have peak lateral displacement, so lower values indicate that they're reaching more straight to the target. It's a, it's, a small, it's a small improvement in exercise shown in black, but yet it's significant during skill acquisition. And 24 hours later, there's an increased performance at the right arm retention task. Nothing seemed to happen on the interlimb transfer part, <coughs> for, at least for reaching accuracy. What I also found is that exercise decreased reaction time at the task. You can see that 
uh, during skill acquisition exercise, they were uh, in the exercise condition, they were reaching a lot faster during skill acquisition. <laughs> and then at the interlimb transfer test immediately <coughs> afterwards, there was an increased, uh, sorry, decreased reaction time. Uh, so increased speed, uh, speed of uh, reaching. Now the combination of these, uh, these factors, the increased reaction time and the increased reaching accuracy, I believe, shows an increased movement efficiency due to exercise. Mm -hmm. And how I interpret this and what motivates kind of my future research is that this is likely driven by frontal areas like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and motor planning areas like the premotor cortex coordinating with the motor output system, since I have the combination of both increased rea uh, decreased reaction time and, and increased uh, reaching accuracy. But that's uh, speculation for now and motivation for future research. So additionally, a large portion of my research is trying to figure out how exercise improves motor learning. What I mean by how uh, it improves it is what's exa what is exactly going on in the brain after just a bout of exercise itself. The previous literature before my work seemed to indicate that frontal er cognitive performance is enhanced with exercise and frontal areas like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and perhaps the premotor cortex are enhanced after acute exercise. But I hypothesized and thought also that the primary motor cortex is likely uh, uh, modulated after exercise. Whether it's a coordination with these regions with the motor cortex or the motor cortex alone is what I wanted to uh, investigate. So myself and my colleagues were the first to show that an acute bout of leg cycling exercise decreased intracortical inhibition. Now what I did in this study is use these same pair pulse measures of TMS that I described before in the uh, motor learning task before and after a bout of lower limb cycling exercise and I did these measures in the non-exercised upper limb. And what we found was that after exercise, particularly 20 minutes post, there was a significant decrease or lessening in inhibition in this short interval intercortical circuit within the brain. Interestingly, along with that, uh, myself and my colleagues also, and others uh, have also found that corticospinal output excitability doesn't seem to change along with the intracortical inhibition circuits. And how we tested this was just that simple uh, single pulse TMS method, uh, method that I described at the beginning uh, of the talk. And on the y-axis here we have MEP amplitude, and on the x-axis we have TMS intensities of, of, of various intensities, just to be comprehensive about how we tested this. Just testing the uh, uh, motor evoked potential amplitude before and after in the non-exercised upper limb, and what we can see is that there's really no difference uh, before and after exercise. But what's not known so far, and all the knowledge to date is actually on acute exercise, has not considered the role of these interneurons. All the knowledge to date has been assessed using TMS in the PA sensitive current direction, and that's all the work even that I showed you before. And work has not considered the potential excitability differences within this PA sensitive network that perhaps has to do with motor sequence learning, as I showed you before. So my hypothesis was that if uh, motor learning actually uh, modulates these AP sensitive interneurons and that if exercise enhances motor learning, then it follows that these AP sensitive interneurons would underlie the neural and behavioral effects of acute exercise. So this is what I thought. I confirmed my previous findings using that single pulse TMS in the PA sensitive direction, double baseline and the two time points after exercise confirmed or, or, or replicated our previous findings, but then the AP sensitive excitability seemed to actually change. There's this double thing happening where there's a decrease immediately after exercise and then this subsequent increase in these specific AP sensitive interneurons. So how does exercise improve motor learning? Oh man. Um, it's, the effects seem to be centered around a decreased motor cortex inhibition, <clears throat> as I'm showing here with a check mark at the level of the cortex. And I would also say that it may have to do with this preliminary findings that I showed you before, that AP sensitive interneurons may also be involved in this process. It's hard to see, but I put an X mark at the corticospinal output. There seems to not be a change in corticospinal output. 
nor does there seem to be a change in spinal excitability as I've changed uh, as I've measured this as well I didn't show that data but H reflex V wave and other measures of spinal excitability also didn't change after exercise and what does this mean then and why is it important well I think that this decreased M1 uh, inhibition is indicative of rapid neuroplasticity or it creates an environment for rapid neuroplasticity to occur it's important for early, <coughs> early motor learning stages and it has implications for recovery of function after stroke <coughs> as excessive inhibition after stroke uh, is associated with poorer motor outcomes after stroke as well so that concludes uh, my work on the uh, acute exercise portion and now I'll get to the applied portion where I'll begin with some work uh, of just one study uh, in healthy older individuals and to do with exercise and uh, neuroplasticity. So we know that uh, healthy aging is associated with decreased ability to modulate cortical inhibition, those exact same measures that I was talking about before, measured by TMS. And the, the thought is, is that these alterations in cortical inhibition uh, are, are associated with the lack of ability uh, for fine motor control in, uh, in healthy aging. So my thought was, since these exact circuits are modulated in healthy young individuals, this would be useful in healthy older people as well. So I did a similar experimental design where I measured uh, corticospinal excitability and inhibitory cortical networks as well using TMS. And I found the opposite <laughs> to what I hypothesized, that actually there is a exercise increases corticospinal output excitability. Um, and what we see here on the y-axis is corticospinal excitability, and we have separate groups who performed a bout of exercise and rest, and there's quite a clear increase in corticospinal output excitability that we have so far. This is about 22, 23 individuals, I think, uh, data collection still ongoing at uh, UBC. But this, these are the results so far. So it seems that in healthy older individuals, there's an increased corticospinal output excitability due, due to exercise. And, uh, oh yeah, you can't really see it there, but we also measured the cortical inhibition, those, all those effects that were happening in uh, healthy young people. There doesn't seem to be a clear change that's happening there. So it seems that acute exercise affects cortical excitability different across the lifespan. I'm not sure exactly what this means yet, but it could have implications, I think, uh, for motor uh, deficits that come along with healthy aging, perhaps. <coughs> These findings suggest that acute exercise may be useful to enhance motor performance by increasing the motor output uh, due to a single bout of exercise. So I think that this, this work is promising for now. And uh, on that note, I'll now switch to my uh, a study in Parkinson's disease to do with neuroplasticity exercise and, and motor learning, just briefly. Um, so Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that's marked by bradykinesia, instability, tremor, and rigidity. Parkinson's is unique as, as that it uh, seems to target the basal ganglia, specifically deep areas in the brain, um, as I'm showing by these pictures here. But not only that, there's research that's coming out that individuals with Parkinson's disease also have diminished motor cortex neuroplasticity and abnormal motor cortex excitability when you just measure it itself. So other areas of the brain are also affected in Parkinson's disease, including the motor cortex. The good news is that aerobic exercise may improve PD-related symptoms, uh, as some research is coming out to show that. <coughs> However, very few studies have, have uh, investigated the impact of an aerobic exercise program in individuals with Parkinson's disease to try to ameliorate symptoms, and, and also these uh, diminished motor function and uh, cortical spinal excitability. So this study was designed to test exactly that, where Individuals with Parkinson's disease were either put into a three-month exercise program or a three-month control stretching program. Uh, and we did pre- and post-intervention uh, measures of motor skill practice, that same continuous tracking task I showed you before, and transcranial magnetic stimulation measures of inhibition and corticospinal excitability. Um, the three-month programs for both the stretching and aerobic exercise involved uh, uh, individuals coming into the gym three times a week for about half an hour to an hour uh, for a total of, of three months. And individuals with Parkinson's were mild to moderate in their, in their symptomology. And what I found, uh, again, was 
uh, kind of surprising because I didn't expect there to be, based on the young healthy results, a difference in corticospinal, corticospinal excitability. But what I did find, and what I'm interpreting it as a maintenance of corticospinal excitability in individuals with, uh, with Parkinson's disease. And I'll explain what I mean here. So we have MEP amplitude on the y-axis, stimulus intensity on the x, and we have the measures before and after the three-month intervention. Um, and exercise shown in black, control stretching group, CTRL shown in white. And what we see is there's not really a difference before the three-month intervention, but after the intervention, we can see kind of two things happening. Uh, first, that there's somewhat of a decrease in corticospinal excitability in the individuals in the control group, and a maintenance or somewhat of an increase in corticospinal excitability in those in the exercise group. So there's kind of the two things happening at once. That's why I was careful to say there seems to be a maintenance of corticospinal excitability. And the effect seems to be at these mid to high range uh, intensities of TMS. What I also found in this group is that, there was, is that exercise decreased cortical inhibition and increased motor skill performance uh, after this three month exercise program. I use the same short interval intercortical inhibition measure on the y-axis. It's a change score in SICI before and after the intervention. And what we found is that there was significantly less inhibition in the exercise condition compared to the control. And then performance of the skilled task, we have change in time lag with uh, values higher being indicating better performance. So individuals performed better at the skilled motor task after this three month exercise program as well. So although this is one study, I believe that the results are promising to demonstrate that a longer aerobic exercise program can maybe maintain corticospinal excitability, influence neuroplasticity in those with Parkinson's, and increase motor function that may be diminished as well. And now I'll finish off with uh, my stroke rehabilitation work. So my stroke uh, rehabilitation work uh, applied in, in, in stroke, I should say, focuses on how cortical resources associated with planning, executive function, and sensory feedback contribute to recover fu recovery of function after stroke. Specifically, I'm interested in how these regions interact with the motor cortex that was damaged after stroke in order to help and assist with recovery. So <coughs> after brain damage due to stroke, and stroke can be known as a brain attack as well, after damage due to stroke, which can result from a loss of blood <coughs> and oxygen getting to a particular area of the brain, there's brain tissue damage. And what results typically is the, on the opposite side of the body, or the contralateral side, there is decreased motor function, such that there is uh, less function in the upper and lower limbs. 85% of Canadians who've had a stroke live with persistent impairments into the chronic stage after stroke. That's greater than a year. So, uh, so this is, uh, causes diminished quality of life and, and makes it difficult for these individuals for sure, and particularly for the upper limb. So much of the clinical research to measure and modulate the brain after stroke has focused on what's called the interhemispheric competition model, and I'll ex explain that now. So what comes along with this decreased motor function in the paretic limb and the opposite side of the body is decreased cortical activity in the area that was <coughs> affected due to the stroke. But at the same time, it's exacerbated by increased or maintained activity on the opposite side of the unaffected, I'll call, side of the brain, and increased interhemispheric inhibition acting on the stroke-affected side as well. And it's thought that the combination of these factors, particularly the increased interhemispheric inhibition, leads to poorer motor outcomes after stroke. Along with uh, several others in the field, my uh, work has used repetitive TMS, uh, or RTMS, and I haven't introduced that yet. So TMS can also be used instead of uh, to assess cortical excitability with single impaired pulse TMS. It can be used in repetitive trains in order to decrease excitability or increase excitability in the brain for a period of time, depending on the pattern that you use. So in stroke rehabilitation research, inhibitory repetitive TMS is used over the non-affected side or the overactive side in order to decrease that increased or overactive inhibition acting towards the lesion cortex with the goal of increasing motor function. This is the idea of the interhemispheric competition model. So with that in mind, uh, I completed a study uh, recently that paired repetitive TMS to the contralesional motor cortex combined with motor skill practice of the paretic limb, trying to combine these two things to get more out of each motor learning session that we, that we have these individuals with chronic stroke do. 
We did pre and post motor function and motor skill measures. We were hopeful that we were going to find something good, but the inhibitory repetitive TMS to the contralateral cortex showed no additional improvement. There was no additional improvement to motor function, clinical motor function uh, of the Wolf motor function test, and no additional improvement in the skilled motor task that we had them do as well. So this isn't what we wanted to find, but it was still uh, a telling and, and gave, us, it gave me a lot of information and uh, motivation for future research. So my work along with others is suggesting that maybe contralesional motor cortex suppression is not always the best solution after stroke. Most of the research in stroke rehabilitation has focused on the motor cortex, but meta-analyses have shown that the effect is actually quite minimal when we focus just on the motor cortex, whether it's the damaged or undamaged side. So gathering evidence is coming out that executive function planning and sensory feedback cortical regions could be a potential way uh, to compensate for stroke-related damage in the motor cortex, and this is what I've uh, concentrated my work on. So my work, uh, along with collaborators, collaborators has shown that uh, frontal white matter structural integrity is vital for motor function after stroke, and this is a, a study that we uh, did at UBC where we had individuals come into the lab and go into the MRI scanner and we did diffusion tensor weighted imaging or DTI for whole brain tractography, understanding the white matter tracks in the brain. And specifically among other regions, I was particularly interested in the corpus callosum, the thing that, uh, that's connecting the two sides of the brain with its white matter tracks, and particularly the frontal areas, prefrontal, premotor, and motor areas. So I drew those regions to try to extract that information, and I extracted the fractional anisotropy of those frontal corpus callosum regions. And what we found was that greater prefrontal corpus callosum white matter integrity was associated with better motor function and less motor impairment after stroke, showing that these frontal regions are quite important. So my work shows that not only brain structure of frontal and parietal brain regions are important after stroke, but also the neurophysiological function of these reg regions is important as well. And I've uh, I've completed a project measuring this interhemispheric connectivity from one side of the brain to the other to assess the parietal and frontal regions using a method called trans uh, transcolosal inhibition. This is a single pulse method of TMS where uh, we, we use a single pulse of TMS over this, in this example, the right motor cortex while individuals are holding a contraction with the same side arm, so the right arm in this example. And what happens, what's supposed to happen here is that an inhibitory signal is sent via the corpus callosum to the active side of the homologous representation, and that disrupts ongoing EMG activity, resulting in an ipsilateral silent period. And we can assess this ipsilateral silent period in many different ways to understand how the two sides of the brain are communicating with each other. And this has been done a lot in, uh, in stroke rehabilitation work. But what hasn't been done is transcolosal inhibition elicited or measured from frontal and parietal cortical regions that may, uh, may be involved in recovery of function after stroke. So in this study, I measured this transcolosal inhibition from DLPFC, dorsal premotor cortex, primary somatosensory cortex, and posterior parietal cortex, an area known as SPOC. And in, I'm showing data from a young, healthy participant, but I did this in, in young, healthy people and older, healthy individuals. And what I found was that an ipsilateral silent period was elicited from each of these regions with different characteristics compared to the motor cortex. So what this show, uh, demonstrated to me is that these higher order parietal and frontal areas have strong connections with the opposite motor cortex. So not only that, uh, not only did I find this in uh, healthy young and older people, but with individuals with stroke too. So I'm showing you data of ipsilateral silent period also elicited from the contralesional cortex over each of these frontal and parietal regions. So now, yes? The X axis is in the milliseconds? Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so not only do we see this, uh, this frontal and parietal interhemispheric communication with the opposite side motor cortex, but there are strong relationships with motor impairment, motor function, and uh, grip strength, for example. So areas uh, uh, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, premotor, somatosensory cortex, with more inhibition coming from these areas, it's actually associated with less motor impairment, 
better motor function and better grip strength. So this is showing, uh, indicating to me that these frontal and parietal areas are likely important for recovery of function after stroke. So my work is suggesting that targeting only the motor cortex with non-invasive neurostimulation neurostimu techniques far, is far too simplistic, and we need to consider executive function, motor planning, sensory feedback, cortical areas, and they should also be a focus of non-invasive neurostimulation techniques for assessments and adjunct therapies and stroke rehab. So I'll end there. Uh, went a little longer than I thought, um, but I hope I've shared some uh, interesting uh, findings on the neuroplasticity mechanisms of motor, of motor learning and how adjunct therapies or interventions like exercise and repetitive TMS can be used to understand and enhance these mechanisms and how this information applies in stroke and Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to the CRU UGM, uh, the University of Montreal, uh, the collaborators that made this work possible, and the funding, of course, that made this work possible. And I'll also just plug uh, currently recruiting uh, master's and PhD students uh, for 2020. So if you like anything you saw, please uh, feel free to contact me. Thanks very much. Est-ce que vous avez des questions? <laughs> des questions? Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, Oh, yeah. No, sorry, your PD patient The healthy older and PD. Acute bout of exercise versus the three months of aerobic exercise training. Yes, right, okay. So I can bring that up. Your interpretation uh, seems to be that maybe in old age, with or without disease, you might need more bouts of exercise or more training to. With, can you repeat that one more time? The, the maybe the healthy older adults needed more than just one bout of exercise to, to, mod show, yeah. to show the modulation. Yeah. Well, yeah, so actually, so a, a single acute bout of exercise did actually increase the corticospinal excitability. Yeah. It didn't cause the other effects that I thought. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Data collection still ongoing. You know, the, the the truth is, is the the other measures that I thought would change in healthy older individuals is incredibly variable. Mm -hmm. So I think that that really does contribute to the ability to find a pre post difference, um, and particularly in that one inhibition measure that I was talking about before. Um, I, I I think you're right though. I think it would be interesting to see. Exa extending uh, uh, all of the stuff that I was showing is, is an acute bout of exercise lasting about 20 minutes, right? What about longer uh, exercise sessions or multiple exercise sessions? The, the idea of that PD uh, study initially was to turn people who are sedentary into exercisers, you know, uh, and, and increase their fitness. So that was the idea. Um, the numbers are kind of low with this, so that could be why we didn't see uh, maybe as robust effects. But uh, it, it was kind of uh, neat to me because we did actually find the decrease in that cortical inhibition measure, yeah. similarly to young, healthy people. So the other way of thinking about it maybe is rather than do another study, which you probably <laughs> might do anyway, but again, the data set we already have with a PD sample. Yeah. That would be so interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could. They're, they're, they're the measures that we did were just before and after the three month uh, um, program. <laughs> that, that's a, that is a really good uh, thought because yeah, perhaps after a single session or just a week of three sessions, for example, maybe we would exactly like you said, find mm -hmm. similar patterns to healthy older people. That's a really good thought. Unfortunately, I can't do that with this data set. Sure. I was thinking about the APPA um, protocol that you, uh, you described. Yes. As I understand, this one is, uh, is based on the studies of uh, Wolf Simon and John Rodman. 
so they seem to oh yes create this describe very well this uh, these protocols though there are some limitations uh, absolutely as you suggested they increase the uh, MEP and decrease the MEPs they they were both both related to peripheral plasticity uh -huh. so as also uh, I know of Timon so they also uh, suggested or accepted that the limitations regarding the plasticity uh, are there there is a divergence regarding the studies from jo um, Heidi jo Johansenberg from Harvard yep. so actually she showed that in um, in uh, juggling the, there is uh, the need for more days up to, up to weeks in order for that plasticity to be measured how would you link this divert these distinct results for increase <coughs> decrease the uh, MEPs for the M1 and the necessity to measure the plasticity over several weeks so the APPA doesn't, oh. step, you know, doesn't step for that one um, how would you relate the two, the two hypotheses together? Um, so I think, uh, uh, if I can just repeat uh, what I think uh, uh, you're asking, is, is, is that uh, how do I relate the, my APPA findings in a single session versus uh, Heidi Johansenberg's? Yeah. That, that was the work with juggling, I think? Yes. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, that's a really, really great question because the, the stuff in Young Healthy People that I, that I showed was just in a single session. It was literally just 10 minutes of practice and then 10 more minutes of practice. It was 20 minutes of actually just practicing this task. And we, although it's significant, it's not a huge, huge difference in these, in these specific networks, right? That's something that I would really uh, like to test over time just to see how, because really I can only speak to skill acquisition in that case. I know that because people came back the next day uh, and performed the motor task, they did learn it. But the neuroplasticity, APPA stuff, I can really only speak to, um, you know, a very sh short, acute effect of 20 minutes. I, I, it's a really good question. I think that there might be a transition of those interneurons to more corticospinal output excitability changes over time as you, you know, with weeks of practice. So uh, maybe it's, it's the fact that in these really early stages of skill acquisition that these specific interneurons are changing. And then as you get more automatic with the skilled tasks, then it transitions maybe to um, corticospinal output excitability. I'm not certain. I think that that could be the case, but I, I, I wouldn't doubt that, that there would be a shift in the change of these different interneuron uh, excitability profiles. If Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So, uh, yeah. Just a question and comment into this. The, the students <coughs> mentioning with uh, juggling, they were using the upper limbs and then testing the upper limbs. Okay, so I think we are, for those kind of studies, I think we, we should take into account like if the muscle we are testing was involved in the previous exercise, because if like we are juggling, we are using our upper limbs, so we can create a neuromuscular fatigue that can change the excitability of those neurons independently of skill acquisition. So just which lead to my question. Sure. Is it the, the research you have done like with exercising lower limbs and testing upper limbs. Are you aware of any study doing the opposite? Exercises upper limb yes. and testing lower limbs? Yes, uh, Paul Zare's work in uh, University of Victoria. He's done the okay. arm uh, <laughs> cycling, agrometer stuff, which is pretty cool, and, and testing the, uh, I don't know, definitely spinal excitability of the so exercised upper limb and the non-exercised lower limb. I believe it's the opposite that he found. He found that there was a different, like with the upper limb uh, uh, cycling, that there was a difference, I'm not sure if it was an increase or decrease in spinal excitability of the exercised upper limb and a similar change in the lower and limb. Is it associated with behavioral changes such as like increasing postural ability or something like that? Do you know? Or if they that, are that, I'm not, that I'm not aware of, of, of okay. the, that specific, uh, um, uh, those specific studies and that specific work. Okay. Could be. I, I think that, they, yeah, the reason that they were trying to say that this occurred is, is because it's an uh, upstream to downstream change since you're, you're, you're I, I, I'm not really sure. I'm not familiar with the, the, this exact work with the spinal cord, but uh, that, was, that was the thought. No problem. Yes? <coughs> the middle part of your talk, you showed us some exercises that were kind of small. I was just wondering, did you think about the possibility of doing um, a dose response? Like those kind ones, of right? Design, mm -hmm. Dose response kind of design where you have like some people doing weak uh, 
resistance and some people doing moderate resistance and other people mm. doing vigorous exercise. That way you can get a proportional effect size and it will be more compelling. Yeah. And yes, have you thought about that? Oh, sorry. No, um, I didn't mean to inter interrupt you. Um, I, I, I have uh, thought about doing that. So, so just different intensities or durations, uh, yeah. playing with the dose of exercise. Absolutely. Um, I, I would, I'd love to do that. It, I was constrained, for example, in this study because I did it within subjects design. So people were doing the motor learning task. I, I, it was very difficult to, to do already because they were doing the opposite rotations on different times. So without with having multiple exercise intensities, for example, in that study, it, it would be confounding and you'd have to have separate uh, groups of individuals, which would be fine. Uh, and I would be very interested in, in doing that. There, there's a lot of uh, research to sit coming out to suggest different intensities have different effects or different types of exercise do not only just the intensity, but whether it's in interval training exercise, you know, up low, uh, high, low, high, low, high, low, versus just the stuff that I uh, am showing is a continuous, moderate, kind of boring uh, <laughs> exercise. I mean, it is. And the other thing uh, I wanted to mention was, you know, you got to open up a little bit more when you're looking at stroke. Maybe look at a wider variety of executive functions because impulsivity is a really big problem with post-stroke. So maybe there's going to be a diffusion effect to the impulsivity factor. Impulsivity factor? Yeah, uh, behavioral impulsivity. Oh, okay, okay. I'm just yeah. thinking of a benefit that Interesting. might be a really good benefit. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Maybe just one quick question. Yes. Uh, in, in the studies where you stimulate other parts of the of the brain, oh, yeah. the of, of the uh, contralateral hemisphere. Yep. Your favorite interpretation is cortical cortical inhibition. Yes. But but you also mention but you also see it from any side. But you mentioned <laughs> that there were different maybe delays or properties of the inhibition. Do you, do you have any evidence that this is more than a non-specific effect? That's that's yeah that's that's a great question. Um, uh, so so first, uh, I, I thought that that was the case because I, I was a little surprised that that, that there was this uh, you know effect at each of these locations. So so the first thought and uh, people said to me is that when I'm simulating here, how do you know that it's not just current spread or shunting to this motor cortex then across? Could be, could definitely be the case. So for, I, I would say that there's a couple pieces of evidence that I have that I did I didn't share. I don't think I have it in slides, but that would uh, that would uh, talk against that and say that there's specific different communication. One is that you mentioned delays. So the delay from each, uh, at the onset of the silent period is significantly different from each of these regions, for example. So the motor cortex being the quickest, because it goes from here to here, right? And this being significant length longer, this being significant longer, and so on. I, I accept, though, that you could just say, OK, the reason that it takes longer is because it's going from here to here and then across. That still doesn't work, right? So we did a control experiment where, um, so in, th in this case, individuals are holding a contraction with this, uh, this arm, right? And we are stimulating on the same side of the brain, uh, same side of the brain. So what the thought was to control for, to test if there is an actual shunting of activity from the DLPFC to the same side M1, I had people hold a contraction in another condition with the opposite limb. So with the opposite limb. So if you stimulate over the motor cortex when you're holding a contraction with the opposite side, you see this very clear, obviously MEP, and then afterwards a cortical, cortical, uh, uh, contralateral uh, silent period. So the thought was, if, to me, if we stimulate DLPFC, and if it's just shunting activity down to the same motor cortex and across, then we should see that contralateral silent period as well. We don't see it from dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We don't see it from the Spock area. We see it a little bit mm -hmm. from S1 and a little bit from uh, uh, the, the uh, dorsal premotor cortex, although they're significantly different, like they're significantly less. So I can say with pretty good confidence that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and superior parietal occipital cortex are likely not shunting towards M1, and it's not just this general effect. I can't say for sure about uh, about the premotor and S one. Yeah.
just comment. Very interesting, Jason. Thank I you. I was wondering, in your last reflections, you know, these uh, executive function areas, and trying to understand what is really happening in the whole system when you stimulate. Have you thought about combining this with functional connectivity studies in which you could see, you could take the whole set of areas as a working network and with stimulation, measuring changes before and after stimulation within the network mm. in terms of connectivity and integration between changes in information between the different areas in the network that could provide, that would be a different way of having an answer about where does it happen within a single set of areas. Yeah, that, that would be really interesting, uh, particularly if we could do that within the scanner. Yes, that's I know exactly that, that, yeah, exactly. single, uh, single <laughs> pulse of TMS. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. That would be... Or, or even right before the stimulation and right after the mm. stimulation, you could also um, take these images and do the... So a functional, like a resting state uh, sort of... Ah, yes, okay. functional connectivity. You yep. can select a network. It can be your target network. Mm -hmm. You can stimulate... Uh, you can measure before stimulation, stimulate, measure after stimulation, and do functional connectivity analysis mm -hmm. at integration between the different areas of the network. Mm -hmm. that, that, that sounds really interesting. I'd be very interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can place that for the meeting tomorrow morning? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for our meeting tomorrow. <laughs> I was just wondering, were you, did you control for um, like the participants that you were testing, the older adults, at mm -hmm. the level of sedentary, to, like how sedentary they were, how, and because mm -hmm. coming from, you know, exercise, kinesiology, for sure. um, like we know that someone's uh, experimental development and their history, and, you know, maybe implications in sports or early on in life uh, might have an impact later on. Absolutely. So how might that have affected uh, the results you got? Right, yeah, so, so you're asking like, like what maybe is their physical activity profile? Uh, yeah. What's their fitness level? What's uh, their pre, yeah. Uh, so we do have, for that healthy older study, we do we have tons of data. <laughs> Just on, on, you know, uh, 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 the, the IPAC, for example, and we have physical mm -hmm. fitness like VO2, or, or the stress test uh, uh, fitness levels. We don't have accelerometry. We were going to, and then uh, mm -hmm. and then that got scrapped from the study. But uh, we have questionnaires uh, mm -hmm. to to at least kind of uh, speak to their physical activity levels, and we have the results of their stress test to to see what their actual um, to, to give us at least a, a, a kind of uh, indirect measure of their of their fitness and cardio respiratory fitness level. So I haven't looked at that data yet, but that that would that's definitely something we're we're planning on putting into you know the model, looking at, at this data for sure. Yeah, for example, that young healthy data with the small effect sizes that, that I showed, I had IPAC uh, data on that as well. Threw that into the model just to see if physical activity levels uh, changed or, or influenced the results. Turns out, at least in the young healthy people, it didn't. So people got this enhanced effect uh, to motor learning or motor adaptation. Um, no matter their their physical activity level, at least in the group of people that I had. But I think it's a really important question, for sure. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Thanks.